I could barely see anybody. Um, so thanks for coming out uh, at the, the tail end of what turned out to be a really great conference. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about philosophy today. Um, so you might ask why, right? Why, why are we talking about philosophy, and in particular, a thread within philosophy called phenomenology? Um, we'll get into that a little bit more um, a bit later, but I think this stuff is important in the sense that if we're to talk about phenomenology, and if, if we were to define it in a, in a very small bucket, phenomenology is essentially the study of human experience. So when we talk about interaction design, experience design, they seem to kind of go hand in hand, right, with this rich body of knowledge we have about the study of human experience. Um, what I've always found was kind of strange is that when we talk about the subfields of, of interaction design or UX design or other fields that have, have influenced it in some way. Um, we talk about cognitive science, cognitive psychology, anthropology, etc. We don't often talk about philosophy. And I think that's an important discussion to have. Um, so hopefully that's kind of what we're going to do today. Um, just a couple notes on this particular presentation before I get started. Usually when I do presentations, I'll kind of just put together a deck and then I'll get up on stage and I'll wing it. I'll just improvise. Um, this time I decided to be a little bit more disciplined, so I wrote it as an essay first. So essentially what I'm going to do is read the essay and the slides will go along with it. So that's my long way of saying I'm sorry if I'm looking down at my screen more than I'm looking at you guys, but I'm just reading. Um, a couple other points I just wanted to make was that there are some design theorists, mostly on the academic side, that have made this connection before between design in general and, and a phenomenological approach. So none of this stuff is necessarily new. These connections have already been made. Um, they just don't enter into conversation a lot. Um, and then the last point is that this is breaking a huge rule of, of present, presenting, but some of these slides have a lot of text on them. Um, and I'm sorry for that, but I think the quotes are important and, and we'll go through them and I'll read through them together. So, I'm kind of curious, I could barely see, but is anybody familiar with phenomenology? Maybe you've heard it before. Excellent, wow, a lot of people. Has anybody studied it in detail? Maybe in college or grad school or whatnot? Okay, excellent, awesome. So this might be kind of a review for some people. So if you're not familiar, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to do phenomenology a pretty big disservice and try to define it within a couple of slides and a couple of key points. So the first one we already touched upon a bit, right? Phenomenology is the study of human experience. It's the study of how we experience and interact with everyday objects. Um, this can be modern technology, it can be very analog um, objects in our world, chairs, um, hammers. Hammer is always the big example that comes up in, in phenomenological uh, uh, philosophy and it'll come up here too. Second is that the use of technology shapes our conception of ourselves and the world. So one of the big points about phenomenology is that the objects that we use shape our experience. And what phenomenology was about, and we'll hit on this a little bit later, was breaking down the barriers between the self and the world, right? So those objects are kind of the, um, uh, the midpoints or the in-betweens in between ourselves and, and what we think of as the world. And then the last one, this is, this is nothing new for, for interaction designers, I don't think, but all of our experiences occur in, within what phenomenology calls a use context. Um, so just getting at that idea that we can't divorce the object or the use of an object away from, uh, from its, its uh, contextual background in which it gets manipulated or used. All right, so let's get started. So one of the main applications of phenomenological theory is technology studies. Martin Heidegger, the good-looking guy on the screen there, uh, was one of the first Western philosophers to seriously examine the role of technology in everyday existence. His concern is with how people interact with technological objects and what this interaction says about our conception of reality. Interaction design and experience design take a somewhat similar approach. As design practices, they analyze interactions between users and technology in order to design better systems. So Heidegger broke from earlier uh, phenomenological philosophers, such as his teacher, Edmund Husserl, um, pretty much with a single word that was in the title of this talk, Dasein. 
So Dasein refers primarily to Heidegger's reconceptualization of the subject or the individual. Um, instead of subjectivity, he classifies Dasein, translated literally uh, from the German as being there, as the individual's mode of being within the world. So Heidegger says that, now bear with me on this quote, it's an awkward translation. Dasein exists as a being for which, in its being, that being is itself an issue. So Heidegger sought to base his work on the mundane existence, not of the human and the world as separate entities, but of the human and the world combined in, in what he called Dasein. So Dasein implies a certain sense of knowledge and concern over this being there. Dasein then is a sentient mode of being. It's involved in the world, its choices, and its outcomes. Dasein is concerned with itself as Dasein. Turner, Turner, and Carroll state that Heidegger holds that human beings and the world are not two distinct entities, but only one which results from Dasein's involvement in the world. Thus, the in of being in the world is unrelated to ideas of Aristotelian containment, so it's not like you're in a space. Um, instead, in is better understood in terms of involvement. Heidegger characterizes everyday life as being an engaged, absorbed involvement with an undifferentiated world. So Heidegger took a, a pretty big step when he called for a complete rejection of Cartesianism, or the belief that the mind and the body are totally separate, and that mental phenomena, um, for the most part, dominate physical action. His philosophy can be classified as a praxis philosophy. So praxis, in, in its simplest form, is just theory-driven practice. We only develop theoretical models through active engagement with the world, and practice is, at least in part, informed by theoretical, cultural, common sense models of how the world works. The emphasis here is on everyday interaction as a means of gaining knowledge and understanding. So emphasizing praxis over the theoretical formulations results in this very significant epistemological shift in our understanding of objects. Reliance on things like mental models or representations is no longer relevant. And this idea of knowing how is more useful than knowing that. As Hubert Dreyfus explains, to understand a hammer, for example, does not mean to know that hammers have such and such properties and that they are used for certain purposes, or that in order to hammer, one follows a certain procedure, i.e., understanding a hammer at its most primordial means knowing how to hammer. So the ultimate goal, then, is to accurately determine both the theoretical and the practical interpretations and use patterns for a particular product. Don Ide explains, the things of technology, the instruments, and the activities of subjects which engage them appear only as they do against a background and founding stratum of some kind of framework. Technology in its ontological sense is not just the collection of things and activities, but a mode of truth or a field in which things and activities may appear as they do. So from a Heideggerian perspective, the end goal of something like user testing, for example, might be to gather knowledge about the background in the mode of truth that that background discloses when a user interacts with a particular artifact. Or to put it another way, the object is a means to access truths residing in the larger background system. Or from the other side, background knowledge only becomes evident when manifested through an object. So how is it that a, that a mode of truth is, is disclosed by technology? Heidegger's position holds that humans can only come to know themselves by knowing the tools that they use. In this sense, Heidegger's analysis of tools is a very pragmatic one. He starts from the assumption that all tool use is in order to accomplish something else. As a result, he concludes that the nature of time, hence his main text, being in time, is based on humans existing ahead of themselves. We exist to, to accomplish goals, and technological objects are a means by which we do so. This kind of sounds familiar, right? So the conditions that serve as the background of technology use are what we think of as the world. Humans learn and interact against the backdrop and with the backdrop of worldly conditions or context. Daniel Andler says of context, the context phenomenon is a basic characteristic of our cognitive or mental lives. Uh, which consists in the fact that we are never, at least in natural circumstances, confronted with any task at all outside a context. There's no such thing as understanding a word, translating a sentence, 
solving a problem, however simple, deciding on an appropriate response to a demand independently of some context in which the word, sentence, etc., has in fact appeared. For human beings, signs, demands, tasks never show up in isolation. So language becomes the structural and contextual support for our dealings with the world. As such, it shapes our experience of discrete objects and the interaction between humans and objects. In this way, context is not simply the sum of all things and associated meanings, but rather the inter interrelation between things and meanings. We cannot refer to things in isolation, even as something as simple as a pencil is wrapped up in a multitude of cultural references, and most importantly for phenomenology, its conditions of use in the world. That is, we might know that a pencil is made of certain materials and has a certain shape, but more importantly, we know how to use a pencil in order to write. Even further, we know that the use value of a pencil is particularly suited for when the writer seeks a lack of permanence. In his core text, Being in Time, Heidegger introduces a model for how we might understand interaction with objects. The terms he uses in German are Vorhandenheit and Zuhandenheit, but they have no English equivalent. Um, they're commonly translated as presence at hand or readiness to hand. Presence at hand is the relationship to an object based on theoretical knowledge and scientific observation. The object e exists against the observer as wholly other, factual and analyzable. It is the relationship to an object not in use, a state that can be broken down into di discrete facts, decontextualized as an object of examination, and analyzed according to its existence outside the relationship to a user. This is the domain of knowing that. Readiness to hand is the relationship between the object and a user based on active engagement. The relationship and the subsequent meaning that emerges from it is predicated on the, the object in use in order to accomplish an end goal. This is the domain of knowing how, in which a user achieves a sense of fluidity, acting through the object as opposed to with or upon the object. The object itself fades into the background of relations that enable the user to accomplish a task. Dasein always exists ahead of itself. We're constantly focused on a future event, merely using the present to accomplish that future. So in this sense, an object with which one is not currently engaged simply exists as a present-at-hand piece of material. But when it's picked up and used, however, it becomes an embodied instrument. So take the example of typing an email. If you're fluent with a standard keyboard, your focus is likely not on the keys, but rather on the message on the screen, how the reader might interpret your message, and what words to choose. Your relationship to that keyboard is one of readiness to hand. You're acting through the keyboard in order to accomplish a goal of sending an email. Now, imagine if while typing, you misspell a word, which results in it being underlined in red on the screen, signifying this word is not spelled correctly. At that moment, since your focus was on the screen and not on the keyboard, the red line breaks that ready-to-hand relationship with the keyboard and makes you conscious of the keys. You now have to go back and deliberately, consciously, retype the word. The keyboard has become present at hand. Heidegger might refer to this interaction as making the object conspicuous. While in the ready-to-hand mode, the object blends into the background of worldly relations. When the mode is interrupted, it becomes conspicuous as an object of analysis. Returning to the pencil example, it's easy to see how during the act of writing, the pencil becomes inconspicuous. The writer acts through the pencil in order to write a message. But as soon as the tip of the pencil breaks, it becomes conspicuous again as an object in need of repair. Or when the writer makes an incorrect marking and needs to erase. We can think of writing as a mode of ready-to-hand relations and erasing as the present at hand. Heidegger calls, this, calls dealing with the switching of modes coping. We cope with things that break, poor design and unexpected surprises by creating our own solutions to fit our needs. The rate at which our dealings with objects move back and forth between ready to hand and present at hand is too fast to measure. Technology designers see this all the time within user testing. 
It's, it's tempting to think of the end goal of designing a technological object is to create something which, with which users can intuitively interact. Uh, hence, user testing as a means for identifying the unintuitive features of the object and eliminating them. However, there are problems with this approach. While intuition is important within object relations, to design an intuitive object would mean to understand all of the background relations and networks of knowledge, understanding, and experience that affect how we approach technology. It would also mean to create an object so embodied with our natural interactions that its existence is, is unnoticeable. A better way of approaching user testing and usability is through the lens of coping. What we're testing is not whether the product itself can be labeled usable or unusable. We're observing the various coping strategies that users employ. The area of focus during usability testing, then, is not on the product itself. It is the space of interaction between the user and the object, the space where coping happens. The object in this situation, whatever we're testing, tends to beg our attention, but the real focus should be on the complex system of engagement that opens up between the object and the user. This space opens new possibilities for designers. So Heidegger's notion of the truth-revealing quality of technology comes dangerously close to inverting his, uh, his argument involving the context-dependent and praxis-based nature of Dasein. Heidegger wanted to show that the essence of technology is not necessarily technological. It lies in the ability for things to reveal a sense of truth about the world. But Heidegger has been criticized for thinking about technology as an overarching category instead of sets of everyday things. If our being in the world is context-specific, how can technology reveal a sense of unified truth? Designers deal with this question more than they might realize. User testing and usability are a constant dance between truth about a product and its use, how different groups of users create their own truths, and whether each truth holds equal weight against the future success of a product. Hubert Dreyfus explains the situational nature of object use. When the hammer I'm using fails to work and I cannot immediately get another, I have to deal with it as too heavy, unbalanced, broken, etc. These characteristics belong to the hammer only as used by me in a specific situation. Being too heavy is certainly not a property of the hammer. And this non-property of being too heavy likely will not cause a complete abandonment of an object, but rather a new, revised way of interacting with it. Dreyfus goes on to say, when equipment malfunctions, Heidegger says, we discover its unsuitability by the circumspection of dealings in which we use it, and the equipment thereby becomes conspicuous. But for most normal ways of coping, so that after a moment of being startled and seeing a meaningless object, we shift to a new way of coping and go on. So the testing process often revolves around this highly ambiguous and often unanswerable question, does the product work as intended? The question is evaluated in terms of whether users' behavioral patterns match the designer's intentions, often coupled with external factors, such as business motivations, project budgets and timelines, fragile egos, etc. It is easy to fall, within, fall into a dualist notions of product not working as expected or working as expected. I want to argue that user testing and usability studies, when done well, extend beyond the short-term implications into coping strategies and creative misuse. But before we do that, we should recognize a paradox that phenomenology presents for designers. Design thinking has been largely successful in formulating a design process that, instead of starting with business goals, concentrates on a human-centered process by which designers empathize with others, frame a problem, ideate solutions, and test assumptions. It emphasizes understanding a problem before designing solutions for it. A somewhat related movement, uh, the lean user experience movement, also highlights the need for proper problem framing and awareness of assumptions before designing solutions. The entire product development team works to formulate hypotheses to test and validate or invalidate before in investing too much time into the design process. The end goal is to systematically create a product that solves a problem for a well-defined group of people. Each approach relies on prototypes to test possible solutions. 
As prototypes are tested with users, designers return to the designs, make changes based on user feedback. Often the feedback is not taken at face value, but rather interpreted uh, through some kind of a screen. For example, users have a difficult time articulating product features, but they very naturally talk about the problems that they encounter. Designers take that data and decode its implicit meaning. Design thinking and Lean UX have been successful in getting, getting designers to think about feedback loops and end user sentiment driving design decisions. However, there's still a tension in terms of the linearity when thinking about problems and solutions. Lean UX would claim to be a nonlinear process as it relies on early prototyping over upfront strategy and continuous cycles. Design thinking prides itself in a full understanding of problem spaces before designing solutions. But if phenomenology has taught us anything, it's the importance of praxis. The real world situations in which users interact with an object will tell us more about a product than an infinite of time speculating from afar. But there's a paradox here. And I didn't make this paradox up. This has been documented elsewhere. The designer's paradox states that we cannot understand solutions. I'm sorry, we cannot think about solutions until we understand a problem. And we cannot understand a problem until we think about solutions. The first part of the statement is easy enough. Designing solutions for a poorly defined problem space is wasteful and is exactly what a good design process tries to avoid. The second part, however, is more complicated. Saying that we cannot understand a problem until we think about solutions breaks up the linearity of the first statement. Moving from problem understanding to solutions assumes that there's a final answer at the end of this understanding phase. And once we find it, we'll be able to design solutions without anything changing within the problem space. It assumes that we can understand a problem space before exploring all of the conditions of possibility that it affords. The second part allows for exploring these potentialities in terms of solution hypotheses, but it largely ignores the need for upfront exploration. So how do we solve for such a paradox? It's somewhat obvious that we should blend both methods and figure out how to take both a theoretical and a practical approach to design. Perhaps it's best to start thinking about, to start with thinking about technological objects and how they are used in ways that construct meaning, as these interactions are often the focus of, of analysis for both understanding a problem and its potential solutions. Don Iod explains that our interactions with technology are multi-stable. Use cases for technological objects cannot be determined in any static sense, as the relationship between humans and technology is truly interactive. Ide says, technologies do not determine directions in any hard sense. While humans using technologies enter into interactive situations whenever they use even the simplest technology, and thus humans use and are used by that technology, and all such relations are interactive. The possible uses are always ambiguous and multi-stable. Interaction with a technological object goes both ways. We use the object and the object uses us. In this way, to understand a problem space, we need to see the effects of different types of objects and how those new additions affect the entire system. Ide goes on to say, a hammer is designed to do certain things, to drive nails into a shoemaker's shoe or shingles onto my shed, I'd really like alliteration, um, or to nail down a floor. But the design cannot prevent a hammer from becoming an objet d'art, a murder weapon, a paperweight, etc. Heidegger's insight was to have seen that an instrument is what it does, and this in a context of assignments. But he did not elaborate on the multi-stable uses of technology, upon the multi-stable uses any technology can fall into with associated shifts in the complexities of assignments as well. No technology is one thing, nor is it incapable of belonging to multiple contexts. <clears throat> a designer has a certain intention when designing an object and creates affordances to help make potential uses apparent. But the dictation of use is impossible. Technological objects are multi-stable. Their use is context dependent and goal attention, I'm sorry, goal attainment trumps design intention every time. When one needs to prevent a stack of papers from blowing away, a hammer has completely different possibilities of action versus when the person needs to drive a nail. 
or if one needs to prop up a broken chair, a block of wood or a sponge might do the job. So there's a practical element to problems that only reveals itself when users are able to manipulate objects in the world and designers are able to explore multi-stabilities. This is one of the biggest insights phenomenology can offer design. The idea that our relationship with designed objects is context-dependent, embodied, and multi-stable. And therefore, this relationship is mediated by both real solutions that exist in the world and possibilities for new solutions that only exist as potentialities. So at this point in our analysis, we're encountering a break with Heidegger's thoughts to the extent that we're concerned with specific objects of technology rather than technology in a broad sense. Don Eide was largely responsible for rethinking and reframing phenomenology into what he calls post-phenomenology, which accounted for this specificity, among some other aspects that are beyond the scope of this presentation. I described how the patterns of behavior associated with technology fall into categories, embodied, hermeneutic, alterity, and background. Embodied relations are those in which the object of use becomes incorporated into the user's body and enables a true ready-to-hand experience in Heidegger's terminology. A common example is a pair of eyeglasses. The user wears glasses in such a way that they become embodied and remove themselves as objects of analysis. The wearer looks through them to see the world, and given that the glasses aren't smudged or broken, he or she forgets about them completely. In this relationship, the glasses are more of an augmentation to the eyes than they are a physical object. It's a thermostat, but it's not nest. Hermeneutic relations, on the other hand, are classified by their objectness. In this state, the object must be read and interpreted as a completely other, uh, an other entity. Peter Paul Verbeek gives the example of a thermometer as a hermeneutic object. The thermometer provides a representation based on cultural symbols, language, measuring systems that the user must interpret in order to make sense of it. The two types of relations just mentioned, the embodied and the hermeneutic, can often be viewed as two separate and distinct categories, but there's a massive detailed space in between. This is the space of interactions, where poles like embodiment and hermeneutics, technology and humans, subjects and objects start to merge together. A useful way to understand this in-between space is through James J. Gibson's theory of affordances. Simply put, I know, it's, we'll read through it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's a long quote. Simply put, an affordance can be thought of as an aspect of the environment that enables action. A common example is the doorknob, right? Don Norman talked a lot about this. Its shape affords grasping and turning in order to open the door. Water affords drinking, chairs afford sitting, pens afford writing, etc. Gibson saw affordances as much more than objects in the environment. He viewed an affordance as the connective tissue between the self and the world. When in use, Gibson said, a tool is a sort of extension of the hand, almost an attachment to it or part of the user's own body, and thus no longer a part of the environment of the user. But when not in use, the tool is simply a detached object of the environment, graspable and portable to be sure, but nevertheless external to the observer. This capacity to attach something to the body suggests that the boundary between the animal and the environment is not fixed at the skin, but can shift. More generally, it suggests that the absolute duality of objective and subjective is false. When we consider the affordances of things, we escape this philosophical dichotomy. So the theory of affordances is a way to resist the urge to categorize human experience into unnecessarily restrictive buckets. Instead of thinking only about self and world, we could think about this, the space in between. Gibson says, an affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective and objective and helps us to understand its inadequacy. It is equally a fact of the behavior and a fact, or I'm sorry, a fact of the environment and a fact of behavior. It is both physical and psychical, yet neither. An affordance points both ways, to the environment and to the observer. So when we think of entities and objects, there's an entire space of interaction in between. And this is where interaction designers work. Technology mediates the relationship between humans and their world. 
It is not that technology shapes behavior, nor is it that behavior shapes technology. They co-construct one another. Peter Paul Verbeek has been influential in this conversation over the last decade, focusing on rethinking linear frameworks of human technology relations. Verbeek states, technologies co-shape the human and world, and thus also human relationships with technology itself. Human beings are not sovereign with respect to technology, but are rather inextricably interwoven within it. <laughs> a favorite example over the past couple decades has been the gun. The National Rifle Association's slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people, has been influential in the discourse around the rights to bear arms in the United States. The slogan, meant to shift responsibility off of the technology and onto the active agent or the user that wields it, can be thought of as particularly misleading. While we might think of the person with the gun as ultimately responsible for their actions, it ignores how the simple act of holding a gun changes someone. A person with a gun is very different from a person without a gun, as evidenced by the way we refer to that person, a gunman. This linguistic classification points to a particular way of combining man and gun. Separate, they are agent and object, but together a new form of being emerges in which the agent is mediated by the technology that incorporates itself into the body of the user. We can see some divergence from traditional phenomenology at this point. While someone like Heidegger would conceive of technology as something humans act through in order to accomplish something else, this new form of, of phenomenology, or post-phenomenology, stresses that the object itself also has a mediating role. It is not simply that the human agent acts upon an object, but the object also acts back upon the agent. Together, they become something else. Post-phenomenology has a lot to offer design thinking. It's easy for desi designers to think that their work is the intentional process of creating a set of conditions, including objects that support those conditions, that increases the potentiality for a certain outcome. We'd be hard pressed to find a designer who believes his or her designs are able to dictate behavior. Much of this sentiment, I believe, stems from the same sentiments voiced by post-phenomenology, namely that technology mediates the relationship between self and world. If this is the case, then designers are not only creating objects and affordances that allow users to perform an action in order to accomplish a goal. Instead, designers are creating conditions of possibility for certain outcomes, but should always be aware of the multi-stable mediating forces of technology. Another way to think about this relationship is in terms of sense-making, or the creation of emergent meaning. Designers are creating conditions in which objects, users, and contexts are combined to create something emergent that did not exist before the entity stood alone. Verbeek goes on, people can only develop a durable relationship with artifacts if what matters is not just a matter of style or function. After all, other artifacts could embody the same meaningfulness or functionality, but no other artifact can be this specific material thing here and now. Verbeek's mention of situation or context serves to stress the idea that Heidegger's phenomenology does not sufficiently address the hermeneutics of technology. That is, by taking a broad view of the essence of technology, Heidegger is not able to properly consider specific technological objects and our relationship to them. Post-phenomenology attempts to make up for this lack by examining how humans use technology not only to accomplish goals, but also to create meaning. Designers are not simply creating an object or an interface. They're creating all of the peripheral context that surrounds it. There is a sense that design of an object or an interface inherently includes a concern for the emergent effects of that object. But this concern is not always apparent within the design process. In a certain sense, many designers are already practicing this deep concern for end users and, and multi-stable relationships through activities like research as an empathy building method or user testing as a means of observing technology in use. The inherent but perhaps not articulated or intentional goals of research and testing all revolve around interpreting systems of meaning and understanding use contexts. Verbeek says, the mediating role of technologies comes about in a complex interplay between technologies and their users. At the very moment human beings use them, artifacts change from mere objects laying around into artifacts for doing something. 
And this for doing something is determined not entirely by the properties of the technology itself, but also by the ways users handle them. Technologies have no fixed identity. They are defined in their context of use and are always interpreted and appropriated by their users. Connecting this to the design process, we might say that research maps the system of meaning. Design introduces new meaning into the system, and user testing measures its effects of that new meaning within the context of the entire system. The idea is that we can never know the real effects until they are implemented and experienced. The designer's tacit goal is to see how the state of his or her designed object changes from when it's an artifact laying around to an artifact for doing something. So, I'm really not a huge fan of like takeaway slides, but I included one because I thought it might be helpful. <laughs> so what, what did we just talk about, right? Number one, interaction is contextual. We all know this. This is nothing new. But I think what phenomenology adds is the idea that context of use shapes the interaction and allows for some kind of truth emergence. And when we talk about truth within phenomenology, we're not talking about capital T, ultimate truth. We're talking about many truths. Two is that technology is multi-stable. The multi-stability of use allows designers to discover contexts of use beyond their original intention. Three, usability is about successful coping. Testing a product is not about eliminating the unintuitive aspects. It's about gauging the ability to cope. Four. Interaction design operates within design and affordances. The designer is not creating an object with which a conscious authoritative subject can interact. He or she is creating potentialities that exist as both physical and psychical. And then five, designers are caught in a paradox. We're constantly dancing around problems and solutions. Phenomenology helps us understand that we should explore both at the same time. And that's what I've got. Um, You'll notice the URL there because I'm toying with the idea of writing a book on this subject. So if this interests you whatsoever, um, go ahead and check out that website. It's just a very minimal landing page right now, um, but there shall be more to come. And thank you very much. <laughs>